Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome everyone, including members of the media, to today's webinar, Fraud and Government Enforcement in Times of Crisis. This presentation will last 60 minutes. This webinar is available for one hour of CLE in California, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. For all other states, credit will be applied for as requested. Please be advised that there will be two points during the program where we will pause for CLE verification. During this time, a code will appear on your screen. Please make sure to write this code down if you would like CLE credit, as you will be asked for it at the conclusion of this presentation. There will be a CLE evaluation immediately following the conclusion of the webinar at 4 p.m. Eastern. Please stay logged in to the presentation system where the program will pop up to complete the evaluation. If you have questions, you can type your question in the comments bar on the side of your screen. We will do our best to address them at the end of the program or in a follow-up communication. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our speakers today. Rob Adkins is a partner in Baker Hostetler's White Collar Practice and serves as leader of the firm's San Francisco office. Rob previously held numerous leadership positions within the DOJ including his time serving under President Obama and alongside the United States Attorney General as Executive Director of the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force. He also served as Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Central District of California and Chief of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Orange County, California. Rob was one of the trial attorneys in the government's criminal prosecution of Enron, participating in the prosecution of Kenneth Lay and Jeffrey Skilling. He is currently the national co-chair of the ABA White Collar Crime Committee. Jeff Martino is a member of the firm's antitrust and white collar practice based in New York and San Francisco. Prior to joining Baker Hostetler, Jeff served as chief of the DOJ antitrust division in New York for five years, where he oversaw investigations and prosecutions of individuals and corporations in price fixing, bid rigging, and customer allocation matters. Jeff spent 17 years at the DOJ, many of those in senior leadership positions, including Chief of the Financial Crime and a Public Integrity Section for the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Arizona. Ann O'Brien is a member of Baker Hostetler's Antitrust and White Collar Practice based in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. Prior to Baker Hostetler, Ann spent nearly two decades with the DOJ in senior leadership and management positions. Most recently, she served as Assistant Chief of the Competition Policy and Advocacy Section and Special Counsel for the Criminal Policy at the DOJ Antitrust Division. In these roles, Anne served as the leading authority on antitrust compliance programs and the application of U.S. sentencing guidelines to antitrust crimes, in addition to consulting on complex policy, charging, leniency, and sentencing issues. And now we'd like to turn it over to Rob Atkins to begin today's presentation. Well, thank you, uh, Kristen, and welcome to all of you for joining us for this webinar. Um, candidly, this would normally be a topic that would lend itself to a live panel where we each get to see each other and afterwards probably have some side conversations to informally discuss some of these topics. But uh, needless to say, these are not normal times. Um, as all of you know, the COVID-19 crisis is, uh, well, it's unprecedented and in many ways it's unique. But uh, as we'll talk about today, facing crises is not unique. And probably in the collective memory of everyone on this webinar, uh, we've seen many crises arise. Um, each one's different, but also each is the same, or at least has common issues with common enforcement efforts and response. And you know, we think we can learn from that, uh, help improve our compliance, but essentially use the knowledge, including recent crises, to avoid the pitfalls, um, both from the crisis, but also from the fallout and enforcement of crises such as this. And so each of us on this panel, uh, you heard our backgrounds, Ann, Jeff, and myself um, have served in government as part of, um, and in some instances, central roles in terms of responses to past crises um, and how the government response has been tailored to meet those different crisis, but also how they are the same. And there's a lot of lessons we can learn, um, which is what we'd like to discuss today. So we wanted to start off by just talking about um, what some of those past task forces are, um, which is important to understand the commonality um, as to what we might see over the coming months and maybe even beyond. 
Uh, then secondly, to talk about the current uh, COVID-19 efforts um, by DOJ and, and beyond. Then to talk about the, those specific risks for companies that are created um, by the COVID-19 situation. And then move into uh, how to address those risks, um, both in terms of you know, why compliance is important in times of this crisis generally, but also how to hone different compliance programs to address that risk. And then to come up with some key questions for you to tailor your compliance programs uh, during COVID-19. And then to discuss some takeaways. And then also, although it's not a live panel, <laughs> to do our best to then have some of those uh, questions and answers at the end if we have time. And Kristen, you can move it on to the next slide. Perfect. So why don't I get started? I'll take the first slide and talking about um, past task forces briefly. I mean, as everyone on here knows, we have a long history of task forces being established in response to crises in this country. Um, I served in the government for a decade, which alarmingly is long enough to have covered not one, but two financial crises. Um, it's easy to forget back in 2001, uh, it was actually in the wake of the September 11th attack, the wave of corporate accounting scandals that erupted, which caused a series of then very prominent companies to fall like dominoes uh, into bankruptcy. Now, the largest, the largest of these, of course, at least at the time, was Enron, which was then the seventh largest company in the United States, um, and at the time, at least, the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history, followed by WorldCom and, and various other dominoes to fall as well. That led to, in 2001, the Enron Task Force, um, which, as Kristen mentioned, I, I served on, um, prosecuting a whole host of different uh, matters, uh, including the Enron uh, CEOs, established by the president by executive order, um, and focused on joint enforcement, as these task forces often do, because singular enforcement was not sufficient. And so bookending that decade, of course, we had the Great Recession, um, which really got running in 2008, leading to the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force um, in 2009. Interestingly, using virtually an identical executive order as the Enron Task Force, um, the president signed, um, it created a task force designed to address um, both uh, fraud in connection with the financial crisis, but also importantly with respect to the response to it. Um, very similar to this circumstance. I happen to still be in government, so I was asked to lead that effort um, to confront a very different crisis, but similar here in that we faced financial instability, um, efforts by many uh, to prey upon those who are uh, vulnerable in circumstances such as this, um, and to police and to go after any fraud in connection with the hundreds of billions of dollars that were um, sent out in rapid fashion under the TARP and Recovery Act uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, and there's other task forces too that we could talk about. We have listed here the Hurricane Katrina Task Force, there's the BP Task Force, and, and many others. But the point of this slide is to, to emphasize, and I think it'll be important to what comes next, is the commonalities we see in these efforts. Uh, first, what you typically see in response to crises, and you certainly saw in response to the financial crisis uh, a decade ago, is an effort not to just focus on federal enforcement. Uh, as many of you know who are on this webinar, federal enforcement is good at certain things. Um, it's limited by the Constitution um, and in other ways, and it's frankly not adept. It's somewhat ham-fisted in going after certain types of fraud, in particular lower loss amounts, and in the, using just the financial crisis task force response, what you saw was a task force developed um, from more than 20 different agencies, the full alphabet soup of the federal government, but also importantly, the state attorneys general, uh, through the NAAG, and even the local enforcement authorities through the DA, um, through the National District Association, uh, National District Attorneys Association. And so it was, those were needed to go after, at least in that crisis, mortgage fraud issues, which was fairly atomistic and prevalent and difficult to go after federally. Also areas where the federal um, statutes didn't lend themselves adroitly, like in uh, price gouging, um, an issue here as well. So that's a commonality that you see in these efforts. Another is to focus not just on criminal, which gets most of the headlines, but civil, which is much more flexible, especially the state AGs who have different powers, some criminal, some civil, some both. 
You also want to make sure, and you often see, that you're using existing resources. You're not creating a massive new agency from scratch. It's inefficient. Most of the enforcement mechanisms exist. They're just not working together to go after all the different ways in which the frauds and other things can manifest themselves. So a lot of information sharing. Again, going back to the last major task force, the FFETF, the Financial Crisis Task Force, they used FinCEN and other agencies to make sure that, that the different enforcement powers were communicating together. And we should assume that uh, enforcement authorities are doing the same now in response to COVID. Uh, there's also a need for public outreach, hotlines. Uh, again, going back to the financial crisis, there was the stopfraud.gov website, um, which the FTC and others um, helped use to take in complaints about potential fraud and then to send out community service messages to help prevent fraud from occurring and how to protect yourself. And then lastly, um, there's the need to, in every task force, to try and establish priority, to show what discretionary resources and decisions of the, of the government will be directed towards. Um, going back to the, the financial crisis task force, they put in every U.S. attorney's office in the country a financial fraud coordinator, uh, whose job it was to uh, communicate with the other coordinators, make sure that we understand trends, um, to work together, but also to send the message of priority. This is an area of focus, and um, if people are found to have potentially interfered with TARP and Recovery Act funds, or to be preying upon the vulnerable, or to be engaging in insider trading or price gouging, each of these will command the attention, maybe not the prosecution, but the attention um, of government resources. And so that's, those are things that you see repeated time and again in crises and in the response um, by task forces set up, including uh, those that I served on. And so with that, I think as, as interesting backdrop, I wanted to, to turn to, to Anne to talk about this crisis, what we're facing right now um, with COVID-19. Anne? Thanks. Um, it's such a pleasure to do this panel with Rob and Jeff and, and to be recently reunited with them at Baker. Rob's a very humble guy, but he was just an amazing leader of the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force that I had the pleasure of uh, working with him on as the antitrust division rep on that task force. Um, and Jeff has been a colleague of mine for 18 years at the antitrust division with only a, a brief gap before I, I came over and started uh, with him at Baker. Um, and he's a big part of why I joined Baker and just a longtime friend and colleague. So with that, I couldn't be more excited to be with them both at Baker and, and have us all together today. Um, and thank all of you so much for spending your valuable time with us uh, to log on to a webinar during these difficult times. So um, I guess we can move to the next slide. That would be great. What I'm going to do is just cover the DOJ's immediate response to the COVID crisis. And it really is rapidly changing and updated every day. Um, the DOJ has put together a coronavirus response page. The link is here. This isn't a task force. There's not a corona task force. Yet it looks a lot like the efforts of the financial fraud task force to kind of pull resources together in one place and highlight COVID-related work of the department coordinate that, get the message out, and bring people within the department, different agencies and stakeholders together. So that webpage is a good resource. Um, and as we've seen after past disasters and crises, fraud, you know, both large scale and small scale fraud, are a focus uh, for the DOJ during the COVID-19 crisis. And we can expect fraud to be a focus for, for a long time. As we've seen before, and we can expect to see again, there's a lot of money going out right now, uh, stimulus type packages, just like we've seen in the past, even of a larger scale than we've seen in the past. So we can expect, if past is prologue, to see government investigations of fraud, waste, abuse, and on the antitrust side that Jeff and I come from, bid rigging involving recovery stimulus funds, um, all that is sure to follow. What's the department doing so far in terms of policy direction and enforcement? So just walking us through the last few weeks, on March 16th, AG Barr issued a memo to federal prosecutors directing them to prioritize the detection, investigation, and prosecution of all criminal conduct related to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure many were already doing that. It's, it's a tone from the top type of thing to send that message. I think that was anticipated by many and it came pretty quickly. So that was the message, and AG Barr mentioned 
that at that time there were already uh, frauds in, occurring, including fake cures, phishing emails purporting to be from key health authorities, malware disguised as COVID-19 assistance, and schemes seeking donations for illegitimate or non-existent charities. And I saw just in the last few days, the department doing an update of how many malware incidents um, the different efforts had helped to prevent. Um, so that is ongoing active work where we probably will see future, many more future enforcement cases. We're seeing some scattered ones from the U.S. Attorney's offices, but um, all of those we've seen in past crises and we can expect are happening now. Many of you might have seen such emails in your own inboxes. Then the department emphasized next efforts to crack down on hoarding and price gouging. And there's really a lot going on in this area. So I'm going to spend a little more time talking about it because it's a little novel on the federal level. And before we jump into what's happening now at the federal and state level on price gouging, I just want to give a little uh, context. During my two decades at DOJ, we usually saw price gouging concerns prompted after natural disasters, as Rob mentioned, like hurricanes particularly about spiking gas prices, water, or building supplies that were in desperate need after those hurricane-type situations. We also saw concerns about price gouging in, the post, uh, in other earlier times. Um, and after 9-11, there were concerns, and those were addressed typically at the state level. That's because there's no federal price gouging law on the books that's specific. When Rob was the head of the Financial Fraud Task Force, there was a working group focused on oil and gas prices, which really came from efforts post-hurricane um, Katrina, um, Katrina and Rita, that were, that were those efforts on the federal level, the federal role was relatively limited. You know, I'd show up on behalf of the antitrust division and certainly send a message that if we saw horizontal price fixing or bid rigging among competitors about gas prices or other things, we would go after that, and we did. Um, but price gouging itself was primarily left to the state. Now, price gouging, you know, we've all heard it, we've talked about it, concerns about really early on spikes in prices for things like Purell and outrageous prices being offered. Um, but it's really just generally understood price gouging that a seller increases prices to exorbitant amounts to capitalize on an emergency. But that's just a common understanding of the idea. The actual price gouging laws are much more nuanced and it makes it hard sometimes for well-meaning companies to navigate pricing decisions in an emerging uh, emergency market like we face now. And kind of the antitrust nerd in me always points out that, you know, price gouging laws themselves um, are a little bit contrary to antitrust and free market principles. Well, not a little bit, they're a lot. Because businesses typically under antitrust laws are allowed broad freedom over the prices they charge for their products. But price gouging laws, curtail that freedom during emergencies, and they basically set price caps on essential products during a state of emergency, like the one we're in now. So while there's no specific price gouging law, several things recently came together to make hoarding and price gouging federal crimes, and a real focus of the DOJ now. So I'll spend a few minutes on what's been done and where we are, just even as of yesterday with the most recent cases. So on March 23rd, the president issued an executive order invoking the Defense Production Act, and for certain scarce products later designated by HHS, making it a crime for individuals and companies to accumulate these items either one, in excess of reasonable needs, hoarding, or two, for the purpose of selling them in excess of prevailing market prices. And that's the price gouging. Under the DPA, these are misdemeanor federal crimes punishable by up to a year in jail and $10,000 fine per occurrence. Now, HHS later designated these scarce materials a couple, a couple of days later, covered under the executive order, and, and the links to all these documents are embedded in your PowerPoint. Um, and as expected, the focus there was on essential medical supplies and equipment like ventilators, N95 masks, other PPE, and certain disinfectants and drugs. Essential products in this crisis were essential products for health and safety in that designation. It, that designation doesn't include retail products like toilet paper or food items. It doesn't include gas or water or building supplies like we saw after hurricanes. In fact, you know, unlike after hurricanes, gas prices are upside down now as we all sit at home and travel has virtually ceased. AG Barr at the Daily Coronavirus press conference that day 
um, discussing the executive order, he had some harsh words saying enforcement would be aimed at people hoarding these goods for the purpose of manipulating the market and ultimately driving windfall profits. And he said the feds would be knocking on the doors of those hoarding those essential products, like masks. Now, AG Barr was very clear to say that if you have a big supply of toilet paper in your house, this is not something you have to worry about. But the actual statute doesn't spell that out. Um, and the next day, March 24th, AG Barr issued a memo spelling this all out a bit more. Um, although it doesn't, interesting to me, it doesn't contain further guidance on what prevailing market prices mean. And as a former prosecutor, I wonder how the elements of that misdemeanor offense will be proven to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. We've seen some charges, but the proof uh, remains to be seen. AG Barr also announced the COVID-19 Hoarding and Price Gouging Task Force led by the U.S. Attorney in the District of New Jersey noting that there would be assistance provided from the Antitrust Division's criminal program and also the U.S. Attorney's offices. And according to a CNN article I saw recently, the Justice Department has more than 150 open price gouging and hoarding investigations through the task force, although that was according to an unnamed DOJ official. Now, what we've seen in the last even few days, um, in, in what, a much many of us watching this quite closely, we've seen the few, first few cases here. So the first hoarding and price gouging case under the Defense Production Act was brought last week on April 24th, when a criminal complaint was filed in the Eastern District of New York, charging a Long Island man, Mr. Singh, with violating the DPA for hoarding and price gouging PPE and other essential products. Now, I look closely at this complaint for data points for, for us to use when advising clients and what surprised me was that the prices the complaint cited as excessive included N95 masks at prices of $399 and $499 um, per unit, which is less than a 100% increase from the $2.50 the person purportedly paid. Now, this defendant had been worn several times and was selling masks and other essential items out of his sneaker shop. Um, but looking for federal data points, the mask prices charged here you know, under 100% uh, increase is less than we've seen um, at the state level at some points and compared to known market prices that hospitals, in fact, have been known to pay for these masks that are clearly in short supply and vital. Now, just yesterday, um, we saw another criminal hoarding and price gouging case filed at the federal level against an attorney, Mr. Bullock, and another uh, individual, Mr. Young, in the Eastern District of New York for conspiracy to violate the DPA for hoarding and selling masks and PPE. There was a lot going on um, in their scheme. There were fake invoices and escrow payments and empty mask boxes. But as outlined in the complaint, at least part of the scheme involved selling various types of masks in excess of prevailing market prices, including selling K95 masks for $4.18, which they estimated in the, in the affidavit as 300 to 400 percent markup over what was paid for them, what they were paid, the defendant paid for them. So that's another data point on what the federal government deems mass prices in, ex, in excess of prevailing market prices. Um, so we'll see what tomorrow brings. There was, there was one more um, on March 30th, the Brooklyn man was arrested and charged by complaint in the District of New Jersey. That didn't involve um, DPA charges. There was actually um, assault against the, the agents that were there and false statements. Um, and, but there, there was an interesting number cited there that the, he was under investigation, um, including for selling N95 masks at a 700% markup, so another data point. Now, these are all complaints, so we could see these charges develop further if these defendants are indicted or pled guilty, and, and we'll be watching that. Um, there, there is no one you know, this is a time-limited executive order and HHS designation, so this will go away at some point, prosecutions for, for hoarding and price gouging under the DPA, but there is proposed federal price gouging legislation. There has been before um, in the past. It hasn't gone anywhere. If these bills are enacted, the federal landscape could change quite dramatically again. So turning quickly to the states, as Rob mentioned, you know, past prices price gouging was primarily a state issue. There are 35 states in the District of Columbia that have price gouging laws on the books. 
they vary quite a bit in terms of the products they cover and what's considered gouging. And this can be really tricky. Um, some states have, like New Jersey and California, have specific gouging thresholds, the caps of 10% increases after an emergency, while others are much more broadly prohibit excessive pricing. Typically, the good news is there are exceptions if the price increase can be tied to increases in costs that are passed on. We are seeing um, in counseling clients and a number of cease and desist letters going out at the state and local level for alleged price gouging of essential products, um, alleged or just complaints by people that don't like the prices that they're, they're paying. Um, usually those are citing price increases of 100% or more, but sometimes smaller. So just in conclusion on this point, I think the hoarding and price gouging you know, has been an issue in past crises. Um, but it's going to continue to get more attention for a while um, here. And unlike past crises, natural disasters that affected smaller regions of the country and caused shorter regional price spikes, the COVID-19 pandemic has spread throughout the country. And essential items will likely remain in high demand for quite a long time as we see virus, virus flashpoints kind of come and go. So I think price gouging and hoarding will remain a high priority for the DOJ and the states. And it's important for companies to be aware of this web of federal and state price gouging laws as they try to price items uh, through this crisis. So that's it for me, Rob. Um, now I'll turn it actually back over to Jeff to talk about some of the other risks faced by companies during the COVID crisis. Jeff? Thanks, Anne. Um, I, I do want to first start out by saying I hope our listeners and their families are all safe and healthy. I'm hopeful that we, we are turning the corner in this pandemic. I'm really grateful to Rob and Ann to include me in, in this discussion with you all today. They are true leaders, and I'm sure DOJ could really benefit from their guidance and experience at this point. Um, my experience at DOJ uh, included prosecuting institutions arising and, and bankers arising out of the financial crisis in 2008, and then also overseeing a border corruption task force during my time as an AUSA down in Arizona. But based on recent developments from DOJ and from legislation surrounding the relief package, I want to highlight other areas where enforcement is likely to focus. And first, uh, those companies involved in government procurement contracts and, and, and bidding should certainly be on notice. Um, before the pandemic in 2019, DOJ announced the, the Procurement Collusion Strike Force, and its focus is on antitrust crimes, bribery, and fraud in government procurement, um, primarily at the federal level, but it could also be at the state level if there's also some federal monies involved. The Antitrust Division has formed certain strategic partnerships with U.S. attorneys' offices around the country. Uh, there are 13 designated teams in different districts bringing these types of cases, or at least investigating these types of cases at this point. Uh, during this period where government resources are tight, it is even uh, it's likely even more support will be provided to this strike force. Uh, this collaboration is much like that of the healthcare fraud strike forces that are set up in districts where data has shown a high frequency of fraud. Additionally, this, uh, the procurement collusion strike force provides extensive training, uh, as Rob discussed, which is typical of task forces, um, but here it's specific to public procurement and, and those red flags that various inspector generals should uh, be on the lookout for, and, and I'm certain that they will be vigilant to look for signs of collusion and fraud and procurement. Um, there are just two examples uh, of these types of cases um, arising out of crisis. This first, or crises, is in the wake of Katrina, a former FEMA disaster recovery company, allegedly inflated work performed, submitted bogus bills to contractors, paid a bunch of bribes and kickbacks, uh, to be awarded contracts, uh, and then destroy as much records as they could that detailed their the work that they did and the conduct that the fraudulent conduct that they were they were doing. Then previous to that, back in you know after 2001, September 11th, uh, an army contracting officer in Kuwait uh, received more than nine million in bribes in exchange for services to be delivered to troops in Iraq. So it, it's you're seeing it in the in the cases that are being filed in Brooklyn and, and, and around the country. There, there's just there's fraudsters out there looking to, to take advantage, um, and, and companies 
as part of their, and we'll go into this a little bit later, KYC programs will, will want to uh, also be attuned to that. And alongside the threat of criminal prosecution in this sphere is civil liability under the False Claims Act. In fact, there may be uh, liability for any company receiving government funding through reimbursement programs or grants, any of these building, billing federal and state programs for treatment of those affected by COVID need to be particularly careful when entering information to receive the reimbursement. But the False Claims Act, it's not limited to procurement settings alone. Um, as an example, the Department of Justice has in the past brought enforcement actions under the FCA against generic drug manufacturers on the grounds that claims for government program reimbursements of, of drugs were allegedly tainted by a price fixing conspiracy. The companies uh, have been found to be engaged in some sort of price fixing uh, were also receiving government funding. The company could be held liable for both. And, and in fact, in, back in May 2019, Heritage Pharmaceutical, which produced a generic drug used to treat diabetes, was charged with conspiracy to fix prices, rig bids, and allocate customers with their competitors. The company and DOJ uh, ultimately reached a, a deferred prosecution agreement at DPA on the price fixing and other antitrust claims. Uh, but in a separate civil resolution, the company agreed to pay $7.1 million to settle the FCA claims. But more directly, um, we see there are going to be significant risks associated with CARES Act funds. As both Ann and, and Rob talked about, when there are large pots of money available, available it, it often opens the door to and incentivizes fraud, waste, and abuse. The CARES Act, with you know billions, maybe trillions, and relief is a, billions, trillions as a relief package. In many cases, the government will largely be relying on certifications for those applying for the loans and the discretion of the financial financial institutions to provide those funds. The CARES Act also establishes a special uh, inspector General for Pandemic Recovery. Uh, this office will have subpoena power and can ask other inspector generals for, uh, to detect and prevent waste, abuse, uh, and mismanagement that, that in the jurisdictions they oversee. Uh, this special inspector can conduct its own investigations, audits, and will review and refer matters on to DOJ for prosecution if appropriate. Uh, their leader is uh, uh, Inspector General Brian Miller, uh, he's former AUSA in uh, Eastern District of Virginia, Deputy Attorney General under George W., and served as the Inspector General for, for GSA. Um, it seemingly appears that uh, this Special Inspector for the Pandemic Recovery is modeled after the, Spectre, the Special Inspector General of the 2008 Troubled Asset Relief Program. Um, that, that office was SIGTARP. We can expect a high level of scrutiny by the current Special Inspector for Pandemic Recovery and other overseers, as well as potentially years of investigations into fraud and misuse of CARES Act funds. Um, there, I just want to point out a couple of differences I think that are worth noting between uh, the Special Inspector for Pandemic Recovery and SIGTARP. First, uh, the current Special Inspector supervises actions with regard to a far wider array of businesses than SIGTARP. Unlike the broader range of the CARES Act relief fund recipients, the primary beneficiaries of TARP at its inception, at least, were a small number of regulated financial institutions and other entities. That being said, um, the Special Inspector for the Pandemic Recovery only has an initial budget of $25 million, while SIGTARP was initially allocated $50 million. Uh, I expect that will change as, as time, time develops, or as time proceeds. Another key difference is that SIGTARP's expiration date was in linked to and continues to be linked to the final transfer of troubled assets or the expiration of the last relevant insurance contract. Uh, by contrast, um, the special inspector for the pandemic recovery terminates in 2025. We'll see if that sunsets or, or if it's extended based upon the number of investigations. But in any event, if, if the current special invest uh, inspector for the recovery follows SIGTARP's lead, we can expect it will construe its mandate broadly and work closely with the Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney's offices around the country in prosecuting misconduct. Companies receiving CARES Act relief uh, should therefore make sure they've implemented the internal mechanisms to comply with uh, 
all the requirements as well as you know, other state and federal regulations. Care should also be taken by the lenders um, as they will be in the middle of perhaps False Claims Act and Criminal Cares Act fraud inquiries as perhaps a witness uh, or subject or, or maybe even a target. Certainly bank documents will be subpoenaed, bankers will be interviewed about the, the role of the bank in the application and certification processes and the nature of its review of borrowers' information and certifications, which is in fact the, the financial institutions must receive under the CARES Act. And it's also worth noting here that the Special Inspector's Office has the authority to investigate fraud in the sale of loans in the secondary market. Presumably this could include uh, inquiries into representations made as part of securitizations or the sale of loan participations. But more generally, uh, turning to really the fallout uh, for so many companies, this is a real concern that when there are desperate times for companies experiencing profit, um, or perhaps market share loss during a crisis like this, the motivation to take desperate measures to save the company are certainly there. Um, in the antitrust bar, defense bar, this is referred to as, as crisis cartels. And this is when competitors are agreeing amongst themselves on how to limit the impact on their businesses to survive the crisis. Competitors might, uh, for example, agree not to kind of cut each other's prices or agree to how to reduce excess capacity while facing considerably reduced demand or even agree to limit wages if they need, if, if they got uh, their large, if their labor pool is running short and they need to work with their competitors on, uh, you know, uh, having labor provide uh, essential services. I, I think at this time, um, particular industries are prone to this type of conduct and so, you know, they've been really hard hit, uh, tur tourism and travel. But it's, it's important to note that the antitrust authorities do not typically treat crisis cartels any differently than any other type of cartels, meaning there remains a risk of an antitrust violation at the state or federal level that comes along with uh, significant fines and other penalties, including potential criminal exposure. So the general position is that businesses must you know, quite do what they need to do, but continue to act independently and compete during a crisis. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Rob, but I first think we have a slide uh, for CLE. Please record the code 1BH2020 for the post-program evaluation. Please make sure to write down this code if you are requesting CLE credit, as you will be asked for it at the conclusion of this program, 1BH2020. And I'll turn it back over to Rob. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and let me just expand on, before I get to disclosure risks for public companies, just to expand on one thing that Jeff just said that maybe to provide you even a little more color. Um, and I apologize for the inside baseball, but I think it's important. He, Jeff discussed quite a bit about, you know, especially with procurement and CARES Act disbursements, um, the, the role that inspectors general, IGs, play. Um, Candidly speaking, in my experience, um, IGs don't receive an enormous amount of attention, generally, um, certainly in enforcement. And prosecutors have varying levels of attention to get paid to IG cases or how active they are over time. Um, that changes during a crisis. Uh, candidly, I know a lot of people in-house in their compliance programs that know precious little about inspectors general and about some of the issues that can arise um, in dealing with them. And it becomes a new issue when a crisis arises because they're placed front and center um, and are given um, much more uh, resources and are also called upon to do a lot more in enforcement. So just by way of one example, uh, the special inspector general of the pandemic, Brian Miller, he was the inspector general of GSA back during the financial crisis and was a member of the task force that Ann and I and others were, were on and that I was leading back in 2009. He, he and I used to go around the country and speak to different groups about how to safeguard themselves um, and how best to ensure compliance with respect to Recovery Act funds that were going around the country at the time. Similarly, SIGTARP, which was mentioned, was another member of the task force designed to prevent fraud and misuse of TARP funds that were going out. And I mention it only because it's a change. It's a little bit different. The IG doesn't change necessarily, but the focus 
and maybe even the compliance um, with that group. There's a group of them called SIGI. It's the group of IGs. Um, they communicate a lot. They all know each other. Um, and they kind of come to the front during crises like this. So I just want to emphasize everything Jeff was saying. Um, that's an area where if you're not familiar with the IG enforcement regimes and, and some of the ways they can intersect with you, it's important that you do. Um, on, uh, sorry for that digression, on disclosure risks for public companies, obviously this is uh, an important area um, and it's a complicated topic. We could spend an entire webinar just on this topic. And the good news is we have. Uh, we did, uh, Baker Hospital put out a webinar on April 14th um, that you can find on our website. Uh, called Corporate um, Disclosure and Enforcement Impact of COVID-19 on SEC Filings. And so there's a lot more detail about this that you can get. It's, it's a, it can be a very complex area. We put it here just so it's encapsulated within the discussion of risk. Um, and obviously, there have been two announcements, one uh, by the SEC, one joint, um, where it, it makes it clear that there's going to be a focus on um, both in terms of disclosure, financial uh, reporting, also uh, forward-looking planning, but also on insider trading. And that's not unusual. There's similar announcements during the last crisis and response, and what you usually see is enforcement uh, coming on the back end of these types of these announcements um, to give a teeth. So I'd encourage you to look at that other webinar um, if you haven't, so that you can incorporate that risk uh, into uh, your planning as well. So we can move to the next slide. So we now, so we've been discussing for some time about, um, you know, the risk, the the enforcement focus, the past history of both civil, criminal, state and federal, and even local enforcement, the IG community, and there's of course enormous consequences that can come from that kind of attention, both reputational, even if nothing is done, but also in enforcement for civil, criminal, uh, restitution, disgorgement, fines. Um, disbarment, those kinds of very serious consequences that we're all aware of. Um, so in light of all of those things, um, you know, how can you best avoid them? And really that becomes a question of how do you adjust your compliance? Um, and, and just sort of stepping back for a moment, I, I often get asked, um, as, as Ann and Jeff probably do, having served in the government, what, what do I think the government expects in terms of a compliance program? You know, how does the government think? The honest answer is the government thinks how everybody else thinks. You know, there's, no, there's not something special in the water there. And so what they're looking for when it comes to compliance, most sophisticated um, uh, enforcement officials I know, even at the line level, understand that no compliance program can, can possibly avoid or preclude all potential improper conduct. But what they expect is a risk-based um, approach, and they expect um, some... Uh, demonstration of the efforts that were taken doesn't always save you at the end of the day, but it's important. And there's really two goals. Um, at least there are when I'm advising companies. Um, one is, of course, to prevent fraud. And the second is to be able to demonstrate in those instances where it can't be prevented that you did all you could as a good corporate citizen. And it's, it's pretty much that simple. What gets hard is how to implement it. And so at a, at a general level, and then I'll let Ann and, and Jeff get into more details, it applies to uh, COVID and some of the um, competitive uh, issues, but at a general level, the one piece of advice that I think is important because I think it's counterintuitive is is the biggest pitfall in compliance by far that I see in these situations if and when the government comes knocking. There's an effort by very good companies to want to respond to these kinds of risks that are very dire that we've been discussing by drafting an ironclad detailed policy with Massive audits, no tolerance policy, immediate termination, large commitments to personnel, uh, tasked with approvals in all instances, we, you know, weekly, monthly, daily training with lots of certification and records backing it up in, in electronic and hard copy maintained indefinitely. And what you do is you feel really good about a paper policy you pulled together because you're a good corporate citizen and oftentimes that's the job of the person tasked with pulling it together. It feels good. Um, it's a great paper policy, but it's not real. And what you're really doing in those instances is creating a report card. You're going to fail. Um, it may be not in the first week or month, but certainly um, as a crisis continues and even beyond the crisis, you will fail a compliance policy that's designed to address all risk equally and unrealistically. And so what's hard but necessary, and it, it, it is nothing we can answer on this webinar because it depends on each specific client in their industry, but 
we can point to certain um, COVID risks that present themselves that can be addressed in a risk-based uh, uh, policy. And that's the challenge. Um, it's not to erect uh, what appears to be really good to try and get you off the hook, because that doesn't work um, from the enforcement side. And plus, it doesn't help prevent the fraud, because it's unrealistic in terms of being implemented um, from paper to actual policy. And so with those goals in mind, um, we wanted to spend just a little bit of our remaining time uh, talking about how some of those risks might manifest themselves now in terms of COVID-19 and what are some of the important questions you can ask, especially in a competitive atmosphere, uh, to find out whether you're actually taking those steps. So I can, I can turn it to Anne to talk about um, how things look in COVID. Oh, great. Um, and just to build on something that Rob mentioned, you know, one thing I see is that in crisis times, especially where you have struggling businesses, um, there are cost saving measures in place. There are austerity measures. And it's often tempting to have compliance costs take a backseat to other needs. I mean, we're seeing that in working with companies that are just dealing with putting out fires in crisis after crisis and emergency decision making. Um, but um, as an experienced, you know, former prosecutor, as we all are, and as Jeff mentioned, unfortunately, desperate times call for desperate measures often, which leads to increased risk. So in the antitrust world, as Jeff mentioned, we all often see this in the form of crisis cartels that are formed to really stay afloat and to fix prices or, or rig bids during desperate times. Um, we saw that not only in crises in the antitrust world, but also if if you were losing market share and your technology was in decline, there were often executives doing things they, they wouldn't have in the past when times were good and getting together and agreeing on prices, uh, rigging bids, that kind of thing. In addition, um, companies are collaborating frequently to try to get vital products to market or to figure out how others are operating. Um, and there's potential for illegal coordination or collusion in those in those contexts. And the DOJ and FTC are aware of those things. They've, in fact, um, provided expedited business review procedures um, if you are in those situations to utilize. In addition, you know, bribes are sometimes paid in desperation to get product where it needs to be on time or to try to quickly get through regulatory hurdles. So I think that takes risk. Uh, in the FCPA context, in the bribery and the corrupt and corruption context. Um, and those aren't specific to COVID-19, but I think they're very real increased risk. And then on top of all of that, in this COVID-19 world we're living in currently, you have much of the world working from home. Um, and we all know the stress that puts us all under. We all know it's not ideal. Uh, you know, many of us are using personal devices or setups we wouldn't have typically used. Um, and People are out of the view of their supervisors or compliance officers. Um, rules are bent or broken, you know, in the laudable efforts to get the job done under tough conditions. Um, so compliance is more important than ever because even if these aren't ideal conditions and, and you know, things aren't operating as they would have be, would be, these federal laws don't go away. Um, you know, they're still there and there's no COVID exception. So where do you start? The good news is, um, unlike, you know, when Rob and I were working on these task forces in decades past, there are some recent DOJ compliance documents that do tell you what the government is thinking. So there's some links to them up there. I highly recommend taking a hard look at them. Um, many of you, I'm sure, already have, but the, the criminal division issued revised, they had a, a previous document and then revised that and issued, um, the fraud section had done a lot of work in the criminal division, but the criminal division revised the compliance guidance and issued it in April of 2019. And the antitrust division for the first time issued public antitrust specific compliance guidance in July of 2019. And um, the antitrust division made you know, a real marked policy shift at that time in July 2019, announcing for the first time that the antitrust division would take compliance programs into account at both the charging and sentencing stages. So the course of the evolution of the division's view uh, on compliance really is, you know, the course of my, my 20 years there. And the antitrust division leniency program that's been in effect since 1993, over 25 years, really has been an important part of the antitrust division um, program. 
the lean fee policy allows the first company to self-report criminal antitrust conduct and receive immunity for the company and its cooperating executives that meet the program criteria. So for many decades, the antitrust division, and I was there and Jeff was there doing it, we were, you know, all in on leniency. Leniency is the self-reporting tool, and the, and the department recognized that and actually had carved down an exception for an, the antitrust division, saying that the division did not credit compliance at the charging stage. It was really leniency or nothing, um, and deferred prosecution agreements uh, were not available on the basis of compliance for antitrust division matters. And that was the change in July 19th when the division announced that DPAs may be available to companies not receiving leniency. And that really, you know, was more consistent with the approach of the criminal division of the Department of Justice. So this compliance guidance was entered at that time. You know, it had been in the works a long time. I worked on it uh, with Jeff and my other colleagues at the division really for years. And it's modeled off of an internal document and looking at the criminal division guidance. Both of these documents, they're long documents. They're 17 pages. Um, I think with a bit of bias that they're helpful 17 pages, but they provide sample questions that the DOJ will use in evaluating corporate compliance programs. And they each start with three fundamental questions. And in the interest of time, I won't go over that. I mean, they're up there, they're common sense stuff. But I think asking these questions, you know, as they're laid out in this DOJ guidance, these three preliminary fundamental questions and, and going through those questions right now, as you face all these COVID-19 related uh, crisis issues is really critical for corporations um, and, and really wasn't available during past crises. So I think it's, it's in the corporate interest to take advantage of this and look at, at, at these now um, when we're in an even more strained situation with the current working environment, with the technology challenges, and with um, people working in a more dispersed location than they've ever been. So with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Jeff to talk a little bit more about tailoring antitrust-specific compliance. Jeff? Thanks, Anne. Um, I think it really sets the stage with what you and, and Rob have, have laid out here. And while, while we're focusing on antitrust compliance, you know, at the, you know, towards the end here, is because there are many opportunities for companies to, to be working together uh, during this time to address the pandemic. And it's just, we want to make sure there's a cautionary note that you got to be very careful when you're dealing with your competitors. There must be a valid, obviously, and legal purpose. And if there's meeting with competitors, there should be documentation about the meeting, agendas, and then almost like a post-briefing uh, so that everything stays above board. Um, as Ann mentioned, the DOJ uh, has put out guidance, and specifically antitrust divisions uh, put out uh a document that's been very well received and, and then certainly outside counsel can help tailor any compliance program to address the size of the company, the industry, as Rob mentioned, and the specific risks it faces. But here, looking, focusing on the slide, specifically addressing the question, you know, who are the key decision makers? Um, you know, it's imperative that there's training for executives who oversee multiple lines of businesses. You want them to feel that it is their responsibility to issue spot for the red flags. Um, you know, prosecutors, it's, you know, being all three of us were there for a while, um, we, work our, we worked our way up the chain, right? So if, for example, correspondence from sales managers crossing the desk of one of the executives regarding business development or industry intelligence, intelligence that references a competitor, then your leaders, the, those overseeing those li multiple lines of businesses need to know how to respond and work with com the compliance officer or the compliance team. But what do you do if the government calls and encourages cooperation? And the point here is that even if the government calls, it does not mean that the antitrust laws go away. The government at different levels has been reaching out to private, com to private companies, uh, as we've seen, um, and either you know, to make ventilators and then also reaching out for private companies to switch their, their processes from what they would normally do to make ventilators. In these scenarios, issues may arise when the government puts competitors in the same rooms and starts to ask questions, um, and the, the sharing of information is gonna happen. And companies will wanna balance the reputational benefit of wanting to be seen as a company that is cooperating, obviously, with the government and helping the public uh, during this time, but they also need to be mindful of not opening themselves up to potential exposure. And one way uh, to do that is 
to minimize that, Sanon suggested is that there's business review processes at DOJ and at, and at the FTC. Uh, and during this time, they are expediting their review of any collaborations and turning that around in seven days after they get uh, the information from the companies involved. I just had a couple, couple of final thoughts um, before I turn it back over to Rob. Uh, companies, again, should uh, be able to explain the methodology behind their pricing. Uh, there should be independent decisions. And having an independent compliance arm of the company should also be involved in these decisions and, and certainly be aware of all competitor compact competitor contacts during this time. Uh, one best practice we've seen across industries is to establish a hotline, an uh, internal hotline to help get help get ahead of potential whistleblowers. Um, you know, failing to do so uh, in, in managing uh, and minimizing uh, those issues could lead to um, several investigations at, at different levels. And then you have private litigation that's also waiting in the wings, and that could last for many more years after any, any enforcement from the government. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Rob. Thank you all for listening. Please record the code 2BH2020 for the post-program evaluation. Please make sure to write this code down if you are requesting CLE credit, as you will be asked for it at the conclusion of this program, 2BH2020. Perfect timing. We were able to, as I suggested, uh, save just barely a couple of minutes uh, at the end here. I know we're coming up against um, the hard stop on this, but uh, we do have a little bit of time, a minute or two for, for questions, and feel free to type them into the chat. But I know at least one that has been raised with me, not just in the context of this webinar, but, but previously, has to do with, okay, so we've been talking a lot about the risk, um, maybe with some history to judge, but what are, what can we expect? Heaven forbid, and we all are hoping against it, but that this crisis continues. Um, and then what happens beyond the continuation of this crisis? In other words, what is the life cycle of these kinds of joint task forces or enforcement efforts in response to crisis? Um, and what might we see here? What can we expect to see, um, not just this month, but down the road? And I have a thought, and then I'll kick it to Jeff and Ann. But to me, what, what it, there is a clear pattern uh, to me, uh, speaking candidly about these task forces. The first is obviously it depends on the crisis um, and how long that lasts. Um, the um, financial crisis lasted several years, depending on how you wanted to define that. Um, but the funds that were dispersed and the sunset provisions on some of the agencies designed to to oversee them lasted a bit longer. But there, those were hard dates that you could point to. Um, as to when that would end. Something similar might be the case here. But in all honesty, my experience has been that task forces almost always outlive the crisis and they die quietly. And part of that has to do with the simple fact that people don't want to disband a task force and be accused of not taking the situation seriously, uh, even sometime down the road. So I would not expect um, these current enforcement efforts to change um, in terms of lessening. Soon, and that probably will be true even past the facts on the ground. At least that's been the case with the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force, the Enron Task Force, we were still prosecuting and going to trial four years after um, Enron entered bankruptcy, and it typically is the case. Um, you get these, it takes a lot to get this moving forward, especially when funds are dispersed, and that policing lasts quite some time. Um, that would be my view as to what's gonna continue to, to happen. And then sometimes on the back end, a task force ends, maybe not with a bang, but with a whimper, in that um, there's sometimes some examples of overreach um, uh, beyond the crisis need and discretion that maybe made some sense at the time of crisis still being applied very strongly afterwards. And you sometimes get some uh, damaging legal opinions or a pendulum swinging back at some point. Um, you can see that in a lot of different contexts, like the insider trading cases um, over the last several years before now. And in some other areas. But Jeff or Ann, any thoughts on that before we close out? I mean, I do think on the price gouging, it will be interesting because it seems like it's trying to address immediately getting product um, to places it's vitally needed and people paying 
gouge prices. I will be watching that with interest because, as I said, it's a new federal issue. But you do have five-year statute of limitations on many of these federal crimes, six years even or more for for some financial crimes. Um, so they could go for quite uh, a bit on that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think just the buildup to put together one of these uh, task forces, strike forces, um, there's a lot of investment involved and, and people get uh, you know, really dialed in, uh, certainly with the procurement collusion strike force, just like the healthcare fraud, healthcare fraud strike forces, you know, they're going to continue on. Um, it, that's going to always be a priority uh, for healthcare as well as for um, you know, whether, whenever there's taxpayer money involved. Yeah. Well, and I see, I see we're up against the uh, deadline. So thank you, Ann and, and, and Jeff, you've got our contact information. I promised everyone that um, it, it would be great if we were able to be here in person, then we could step down from the dais and have the kinds of conversations that usually occur with these kinds of presentations in private. But if you can still do it, uh, you can reach out to us. We're happy to talk with you about any of these issues. And in closing, on a personal note, uh, I just want to say uh, I joined Baker uh, one week before the coronavirus uh, shutdown occurred in early March. Uh, and I could not be happier, <laughs> despite the current circumstances, than to have uh, rejoined and reunited with Ann and Jeff over here and getting the band back together. So thank you both for, for joining this panel. It's been really fun and hopefully helpful with everybody. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And since we are at time, we will do our best to address any additional questions that came in via a follow-up email to everyone. And we will also distribute the slide deck with the hyperlinked materials and Jeff and Rob referenced today. To conclude today's program, there will be a short questionnaire immediately following this webinar. For those of you requesting CLE, please make sure you fill this out. Once the webinar ends, a small box will appear that reads, this webinar has ended with an OK button. Simply click the OK button and the CLE form will appear in your browser. If any additional instructions for CLE in your state will be emailed to you. Should you have any questions, please look for a follow-up email from us in the next two days and we'll be happy to address them and feel free to reach out to the speakers as well. Thank you again for tuning in with us today and be well.